Uh, hi, everyone. It's me again. For those of you who are there in the morning, um, welcome back after tea, by which point, I think I was in the audience. I, can, I know there's a point at which your absorption capacity just kind of dies at the end of the day, so it's really nice of Hasgeek to give us this slot. Um, however, I suppose uh, it's also a good time to be here because I think we've talked a lot around uh, data security and business models also of various uh, providers like PayU and so on. And, um, you know, the great thing about Dilbert is sometimes they have these great moments of, of kind of poignant reflection when they're saying something quite funny, which is that, you know, we're all just a monetizable asset these days. And the best way to dehumanize each and every one of us in the room is just call us data, uh, which is what we're doing. And my talk here is to kind of refocus that data conversation on what each data point really is, which is someone like you and me sitting in this room making a digital payment. Um, and I suppose if we go back to where we started. And I should mention, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Malavika Raghavan. I'm project head of the Future of Finance Initiative, which is looking at policy and strategy to support customers as we see this large-scale change in retail finance uh, that's happening because of digitization. And, you know, about three or four years ago, um, this is how we were making payments. You and I would go into the bazaar, give 100 rupees, buy some fruit. Um, now, obviously, there's inflation as well, so you probably pay a bit more. Uh, but demonetization's helped that. It's also done this, right? We have all of these different ways in which we are interacting with money and we're paying for goods and services. And why, does, why is this picture different from that picture really? Because at the end of the day, it's just two people transacting, right? But what really sets it apart is that every digital payment creates a data trail, right? You and I are creating this entire map of how our behaviors, our financial behaviors, our kind of needs and preferences, which are being collected by various um, entities across the chain of payments. And I guess what we're trying to see here is what does that mean for each customer? So if I just walk you through a standard customer journey, uh, we've looked at stuff today quite a bit from the provider side, um, and I suppose tomorrow it'll be a bit more technical as well. But from the customer perspective, so we step away from wallet slash provider mindset into you and me sitting in front of a computer trying to make a payment, what happens, right? First, you go hit a merchant site. That merchant site collects some information from you, right? Um, that, or then you are then passed on to some kind of a gateway product, say a PayPal, right? Who collects each and your bank account information, your card information, all sorts of things, you know, address, email, mobile, gender sometimes. Or it's some kind of wallet provider like Paytm. So they hold the data, and then you're passed on to the entire payment processing infrastructure. And so this is the great and wonderful complex world of payments themselves. There are multiple bodies involved. There are credit card providers and networks in the middle. You have issuing banks, authorizing banks, agents all over the place, payment systems, clearing houses, settlement systems, all of these different things which are using your data in order to settle that payment. To an extent, we had it for checks as well, obviously, which is kind of the the avenue that we use between cash and digital. But of course, digital just ensures that you have this data trail, which is starting off with you, just flowing through this entire ecosystem and being kind of traded and packaged up with other customer data to make these aggregate sets. And then you have all these philosophical questions about like, at what point is it your data? At what point is it proprietary data? Which algorithm mind what to make what? And so on and so forth. So I'm not going to get into any of that because you know philosophy is not great for 5 o'clock. However, I think this is why we should care. Right? You're sitting in front of your computer, and these are like three risks. There are more, but I think these are the most significant ones. From a customer perspective, we think affect you legally and also affects you in, in you know, just financially. So what's the big one? The big one is privacy. Uh, I'm going to set the stage for privacy, and then Rahul Matan is going to come and like, talk about some issues around that. Uh, then financial risk, because obviously if your data is compromised, the exact fallout of that is that your, the money in your bank account can also be compromised. And then there's this entire question of exclusion risk, which I'll come to, but it's just that when you have all these payment channels available, are you kind of focusing on one end of the market, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, so to start off with privacy risk, right? Um, rather than get into kind of the letter of the law and also how we conceptualize these things, I thought looking at a couple of symptoms of privacy risks really makes it real for everybody. So identity theft is, I think, something that came up in the PayU presentation. The fact of the matter is somebody using your personal information to impersonate you. Yeah? And in the financial context, what this means is that they can go and have access to your bank account. They could be making payments, uh, collecting uh, welfare payments on your behalf, and so on and so forth. And obviously, two-factor authentication has helped that to some extent. 
but it doesn't really solve some of those payment systems that you don't use to factor authentication or you know a large mass of our population who actually receive benefit transfers into their account so there are a lot of reasons why identity theft is you know something significant currently we do have something in the in the law in the information technology act which i'll be referencing later as well which punishes it but as we will also talk about and i mentioned briefly in the morning it's you know it's quite a weak um, kind of structure for enforcement um the other one which is i think the big one uh, also is this whole question of profiling and discrimination so you have all this sensitive personal information about yourself right um apart from the fact your gender and whatever else is collected it could also be the transactions that you're doing and as a payment system what you are is really you are a gateway to other things right i mean there is the transaction in itself but you're also a gateway to other things like you know credit like other kinds of by uh, financial products and sort of physical products now the risk here is that once you have this information about people we know that it can be used adversely to affect financial decision making by uh, providers and you know this is not just like a bogeyman scare we've had multiple instances of this in our country and in other countries where it's used to deny credit for instance or to undertake predatory lending so denial of credit uh, there's something called credit redlining which i won't get into too much but the us has specific laws against this as do some other jurisdictions because we know for a fact that people who live in a particular area if they're of the same community uh credit is just denied because it might be for reasons of religion or race or education levels income levels and so on and the fact of the matter is we know that this happened how much is technology going to amplify that because you're basically sitting on all this data but that's just kind of one point to lack so if these are the risks what does the law say about them uh the main law that i want to talk about is the information technology act of 2000 it was an interesting legislation because it came up in the background of all this outsourcing that was happening to india and essentially you had all these large companies you know dealing with these data sets from all over the world with no framework right like think about it 2000 is when we passed this law to deal with data protection in india um and so therefore it's only a reasonable for us to think that you know it was put together and it did do some level of thinking we have this category that i want to talk about it it does set up a wider you know it deals with lots of things but the thing that's relevant for our purposes is that it says when you collect sensitive personal data or information which we call as spdi because we like acronyms in the legal world um which is any of these things so your password your financial uh, information which is bank accounts and i'll come to like a little gap there health you know mental health uh, sexual orientation medical records biometrics very relevant for india stack and aadhar when an indian entity which is doing commercial business here collects any of this stuff they should be telling you that they're collecting it they should be using it for x y and z purpose only they should then be telling you who they are passing it on to and then finally they should be saying any if you ask for it you should be given you know details of entities handling this spdi um and of course apart from this i should also mention uh, there are a lot of regulator codes i think at last count some of the work that we've been doing at ffi i think there are about 17 sebi codes uh, the securities regulators codes that set out um regulation for particular institutions that they uh, you know look over, have oversight over the rbi has about eight codes for different types of institution that it regulates which also says that for confidential information you should have this kind of data protection rules now couple of things here right first of all they don't really reference the standard under the it act they use a subjective standard they have some kind of uniformity amongst themselves they talk about adequate protection but as you see it's like a subjective standard so as a company if you're a bank say you have confidentiality obligations under rbi circular and then you just say you should have adequate proportion um, adequate protection for sensitive data or whatever data so that's kind of the picture it's great that in a fa- in, in fact we do have something that talks about purpose limitation collection limitation and so on but i think like we all know that in practice uh, this is like a practitioners conference right i know a lot of you like have already said this and in these four worlds like honestly uh, and the live stream uh, we all know that this is how it works you know it's the transaction is not the asset you know your 50 paisa that you're getting for the transaction on upay or which you don't now <laughs> need to pay that's not what really is driving the market it's the data that's driving the market and if that data is driving the market what what do people do i mean we know from um, and actually it was i think uh, shrikant's talk where he had some terms of reference up and he was talking about how widely it's worded like you know i agree to give you my data so you can share it with every man woman and her or his dog like etc etc right like basically you can do what you want with it and that's fine um the other point is also 
foreign incorporated companies for some strange reason aren't captured by that provision I was talking about, right? 43 of the Information Technology Act. So if you have a flip cart who's collecting your sensitive information, which I'm sure they are, what happens? That's like a big gray area that we, ha we aren't really talking about right now. And there are, uh, you know, another thing is like, for instance, transaction records. Like I won't go into all of these points, but just some things to flag to you, like transaction records. We know that financial information, so your bank account details are sensitive information, but we don't know that your transaction records are. Again, you know, that's where all of this credit profiling and assessment and all the algorithms to deal with that are looking at. So there are some gaps is my headline from this section. Uh, quickly, I'll move on to financial risk. Um, again, fraudulent transactions, something we've talked about already. Uh, I guess the, uh, you know, the big point here is, as the law currently stands, the bank is or does not have automatic liability for a fraudulent transaction. You have to go through the redressal system, and if you, after 16 years, get a decision, no, sorry, I shouldn't slag off the ombudsman, they are, they are quite good. If you do get a decision, it's only at that point you're back in the money. And even for a payment system, it's only to return the money at the earliest. Uh, the great thing is that the RBI does have some guidelines out, which have been released in draft, limiting customer liability for unauthorized transactions. And they say if you report the transaction within five days, the bank should bear the loss. And five to seven days, you bear some of the loss. And then after seven days, it's your problem kind of thing. I mean, obviously, we can go into details of that. But the, the headline is there's something in the works. But right today, if you have fraud, best of luck. Um, the, on the failed transaction bit as well, same, no automatic liability, and then I've kind of referenced that law right now there. Uh, moving on to exclusion risk. So this is one that I think maybe, um, surprised we haven't really discussed. It may just be that it's because um, this part of the market isn't really the market that people are chasing right now. So uh, if you are trying to make digital payments ubiquitous, what happens when certain groups just don't use digital payments? What happens if your standard tool of education and awareness doesn't work, right? I mean, what if you have aged parents or aged grandparents, and they aren't just that great with digital channels, what happens then? What happens to disabled people or poor people who cannot access uh, payment channels, right? Um, and I think the gender bias point is an interesting one because if you look at cell phone ownership, I'm sure a lot of you know this stat already, only 20% of the women in this country own a cell phone, right? And uh, even if 70% of them use it, they're relying on the man in their family to, to kind of do the payment for them. How does this affect privacy, right? I mean, I think these are questions that we should be trying to think about if we want to make uh, technology that works not just for this top segment of society, but actually for all of us. Because in the end, I don't, yeah, I don't think that there's this efficiency versus kind of fairness point it doesn't really work. You should build a model that works for everyone. And, and I think the pie is big enough for that as well. Um, and then the second one is less to do with the subject, you know, subjective situation of a person. Like we live in a country where the ICT index, I mean, for digital India, that is, that is a stat from 2016. We are 138 from 175 countries in terms of access to digital infrastructure, right? And this includes uh, in, like electricity. I haven't put down like the electricity shutdowns, but we've all been there, right? And the entire northern grid went down two or three years ago. Um, mobile and internet shutdowns are now uh, reality. Like in 2020, 2016, I think the first six months, there's a CCG report on this. There were 22 shutdowns. What happens in that situation? Like Manipur, right? If you were all following the news, demonetization happened. Mobile shutdown happened. I was in Chennai when Cyclone Varda happened, for instance. And there was just no money. Like people had their houses. I mean, in my house, I live in a flat in central Chennai, and we almost lost our windows. Think about all the kind of huts and stuff like that. You need a large pile of cash to rebuild that stuff. What happens when your LXC isn't there? So that's kind of just the broad points. I'll stop banging on about it. Um, I think the final point here really from my side is, I mean, obviously knowledge is power, but like as Srikant said, I think policy level engagement of consumers would be great as well. I think it's important to think about these kind of issues, which anybody you ask, anybody on the road, they will tell you, right? Like as I, I think, I don't know if you know about um, IFMR Trust's work, but we do work, we do have a small NBFC that does wealth management for underserved people. And they are really bright. Like they know exactly what the transaction cost is. They know exactly how much they need to, you know, how much they need to pay in order to for overheads of accessing digital payments. And they're doing it. So th this is not a silly population that you're dealing with. I mean, again, as I said, um, they have the same concerns that an urban person has, and uh, an urban person can also have a lot of these other um, issues that we talked about. 
The other thing is a big shout out to Nishant, who works at um, IFF. Um, he has worked on something similar that Srikanth was talking about. So if you look at about 1,000 payment apps on the Google Play Store, we've done some initial analysis which says that about 86 unique permissions are asked for. So I've, I've not listed some of the permissions because they kind of, they're funnier in conversation. Um, uh, but, you know, it's 2 to 34 per, uh, permissions on, in, in, on the standard app. Um, like about 11 across, if you take, you know, the one that asks for the most, kind of a median. Um, and it's interesting, I think the Bank of India app only uh, asks for two permissions. I think I mentioned this earlier. And it, it seems to do the same thing that the Bank of Baroda app does, for instance, which asks for something like 36 or more. So the question, I think, as a consumer, you're really thinking, why? Like, why do you need to, uh, you know, why do you need to control the volume on my phone, for instance? which is, you know, I, I don't get it, but maybe it's just somebody has been filling the form on Google App Store. Um, yeah, there's some code that's from Nishant's uh, GitHub, in case you guys want to look it up since you're at a tech conference. Uh, so that's kind of it. I just thought it'd be cool to play a little video for you guys, again, just as a little treat, because it's 5 o'clock. Um, <laughs> just give me one second. Uh, yeah, sure. Do I have to play the volume on my... Oh, I never thought about that. Will it? Okay, I'll try this. I mean, if it doesn't work, that's fine. Like, um, let me see. We'll try it, and if it doesn't work, too bad. Yeah. Ah! I don't actually think it's playing on mine as well. Yeah, I mean, we'll just try for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, I'll just send you the link and, or post it on something. Uh, uh, uh. Or we can do it after, afterwards as well, after I was done. I mean, it's an interesting video. Like, it's, it's a bit silly, but it's good fun. OK, uh, in the meantime, if any of you have clarifications or any doubts on what uh, Malvika has uh, just spoken about, we can take the next two, three minutes and have a few questions, possibly, before I call upon Rahul to speak. Yeah. Um, so, can you just, here, here, here. Sandhya? Uh, no, okay. Okay. I got Hi. it. Oh, one, one, uh, second, one second, sorry. In person there. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's silly. Maybe Malvika can guide us, you know, <laughs> what, what, sh what steps should a person take if they find themselves in a situation like if their UPI ID is misused, their phone has been mistaken and for some while and they got misused. What are the, I mean, I'm a knowledgeable person. Maybe I can Google and find out what are the right steps. Mm -hmm. But even for me to Google is some time. Maybe there is a there is a direct government provided guideline which I don't know. Um, so I mean, I, I last I checked, there was some Niti Aayog uh, like a pamphlet that looked at different types of digital payments. But I mean, off the top of my head, uh, I would say you're probably and Rahul, please correct me or whoever's kind of looked at the legal side of this thing. I would say if you are actually with a bank, a bank issued instrument like a debit card or something, you're probably better off because the bank will have a redressal system and you can go to them. They'll put you through the ombudsman if their redressal doesn't work out. Ultimately, you can reach some court somewhere. You could go to the Consumer Protection Forum, but that's like, uh, again, hit or miss. I'm not really sure about UPI, to be honest, because I feel like a lot of the wallet providers have their own dispute redressal. So far, it hasn't been anecdotally, what I understand, a problem because they are in market capture mode. So the minute you dispute a payment, it's just put into your, you know, it's kind of like Uber. The question is really when that market matures, what happens, right? And right now, that isn't, it isn't clear to me, especially on a mobile, because there, uh, yeah, I mean, you have guidelines under the RBI's kind of PPI legislation. But as we've been talking about, there are lots of entities in the gray area. And if you have to go to try, I really don't, I don't know what would exist there. Uh, anybody wants to add anything? Yeah, there's, uh, oh, sorry, there's a question here, then we'll come. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, hear about something like the Sybil report, right? You get yeah. all the all the records of Credit your transactions, and even if you go and search for a loan somewhere and type in your PAN, they get all the details. Like mm -hmm. uh, they, I'm mean, like, if I see my Sybil report, yeah. I would have just gone and checked for some interest rates or something, but they would got they would have got all the records of my transaction. I would see that there. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to like uh, like I'm mean, like uh, stop these things like uh, from I'm um, like from those guys accessing these things, or are we are deliberately uh, 
allowing them to access like when i yeah. type in uh, is there a terms and conditions that says like we can access those yeah. people i mean actually that's a really great point to bring up so the question of like credit credit bureaus right we already have people who collect our information and share it with banks in order to assess our credit worthiness so like that's actually a good thing because we have one person who has the responsibility to collect our data and there is an entire legislation around credit bureau uh, so it's fully regulated space and you have to adhere to we actually think it's like a good model for data protection because they have to do certain things in terms of keeping your data safe who they disclose it to how and all that um and the other thing to note is i don't think it's all your transactions i think it's anything connected to a loan or a credit card only so if you're doing something else i don't think it should show up on your credit record the fact the 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 tough part of this is actually people who are operating like credit bureaus but who aren't in credit bureaus right so you have um, uh, credit scoring companies that are coming up that don't have a retail front end they are not a bank they offer services to a bank i won't name any names but you know there are loads of people in the market they are scraping also alternative data so they might not have your credit data but they might get your transaction data from the bank then they might have alternative data your browsing history your social media profile this is another great point because the it act doesn't extend to that as far as i understand it doesn't count it as you know relevant uh, especially if any of that sensitive information if it's in the public sphere you don't have any even kind of fig leaf protection so best of luck with all of you with very open on facebook and so on um yeah so what happens when you triangulate say a piece of information from your shopping record with your banking record with uh, your alternative data with your social media we don't know i can give you a kind of a, if this thing is working i think this might be better at answering the question uh, let's see if it does can you hear anything i feel like there has to be some noise yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's come on what on the room sure Uh, sorry, okay, we can, we can possibly take one more question before that. Yeah, I can. Yeah, uh, there was a question right at the back. Yeah, so as you, yeah, as you rightly mentioned that a lot of app, you know, they take all of this permission to yeah. use a lot of data, but many of the apps are like really useful, and there is hardly anything that we can do about it. So apart from policy engagement, is there anything that I can do as a consumer, like? is there any central grievance or we are like or can i contact the app provider and you know yeah and this is actually a great point which i hope we pick up in on now i mean one of the bigger questions that underlying all of this uh, i mean the short answer is unfortunately the way things are set up right now uh, i would actually argue that some some kinds of contacts wouldn't stand up in court because they basically you could argue like duress or you know i don't know how meaningful that consent is anyway but that's a different matter i don't think you want to be filing a writ petition in the high court or whatever the the main uh, the main problem underlying this is i think we've come to a point where we are we are we've understood that the service is the service and the data is the data right essentially what's happening now is if you don't agree to the data you lose the service how is that a fair contract right like if if you want my data that's fine i'll give it to you i think we've moved past the point where we're thinking about data as a fee in the early days of google we did free stuff because we added you know data of ours in order to create this map together and that was great but at this point it's just like we have a service and i want all of this random data from you i i mean the radical view which i don't know maybe we'll even suggest in the future finance initiative is that you have a separate contract for services and you have a separate contract for data and that's just how it is it may just still be a pop up on your phone but it could focus your mind a little right and i think that's where we should go unfortunately right now yeah it's all bundled into one and it's not very fair okay uh, hold on to your questions because we'll have a more detailed discussion we'll uh, have watch this right? video yeah and yeah. then we'll have rahul speak okay this is just like i think that question about what happens when other kinds of data are mined is quite interesting uh, Drie, vier, 
hier zijn. De vierde der zwijk. Meestal over, dus dat weten niet veel mensen. Hoe is mijn spierscheur? <laughs> Maison rouge, balcon, blanc. Ja. Geld, ik zie uh, transacties. Maar ik kent je rekeningnummer van buiten? Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Je staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? 9, 7. Last month mm-hmm. you spent 200 euro's on alcohol. Vorige maand 300 euro aan kleding gespendeerd. 8, ja. 5. Voor een huis dat van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 195.000 euro. Ja, pijnlijk. 41. Ja. Is dat juist? Ja, dat is juist. Oh my god. Oh nee. Ah, dat is kwijt nu eng. I'm not a Luddite. I mean, I don't think you should not like be online and we should just go back to carrier pigeons or whatever. It's just, it's just a funny video. So kind of, I'll end on that and kind of hand over to Rahul now.